All right, well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 13 today. Last week, Pastor Steve uh, finished our series, or at least came to the first close of our series, uh, Resurrection and Beyond, where we looked at the 40 days after Jesus' Jesus's resurrection and how he uh, comforted the broken, he Im- instructed and empowered, he showed up, and all of the things that he did after he rose from the dead. So last week, G- uh, Pastor Steve talked about how Jesus instructed, his instructions to us started small, You know, we got to start with the little things. Jesus says, if we're faithful with the little, we'll be given much. He talked about how his instruction to us came from Scripture. We need to be living and basing our lives off of what the Word of God says. Amen? And he talked about how the one who empowered Jesus, the Holy Spirit, empowers us. The Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts as believers and gives us a power to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. Amen? Amen? So... Because we have a great commission to go to the world and make disciples of all nations. It's our highest call, and it's not just our mission, it's our commission. We get to go and move alongside of Jesus as he builds his church. Amen? Aren't you glad you don't have to do it on your own? Aren't you glad that we don't have to build the church? Aren't you glad that Pastor Steve and I are not building this church? Don't think so. No, seriously, I'm glad. I'm glad that I'm not building this church. So let's pray and we can get started. If you would, bow your heads. Lord, we just thank you for your faithfulness to us, God. We thank you for how you call us into your story. Lord, how you call us to follow after you, follow in your footsteps, do what you do, speak what you speak, just like you did with the Father. Lord, and I pray that you would help us and open our eyes to your word this morning. Father, I pray that you would anoint me to rightly divide your word, God, that we would be able to see you more clearly today because of it, God. Father, we just pray that you would continue to bless Pastor Steve's efforts in Guatemala as he wraps up this training session with these pastors and leaders. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to serve others who will serve others. Father, we just pray that you would continue to move in us and move through us. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Amen. So, like I said, Pastor Steve is in Guatemala. He is, it's cool because he is helping to serve others who will serve others who will reach others for Jesus. Amen? I mean, think about that. We get to serve others who are serving others in hopes that they will serve the Lord. That's a wonderful thing. You know, oftentimes, I would say every time, because this is how God works, We don't suddenly and spontaneously, well, I should say this, God can send people dreams and stuff, but most of the time, he sends someone into another person's life to share the good news of Jesus. Right? You probably didn't spontaneously show up in your seat this morning. You probably heard, maybe, maybe years ago, you probably heard through somebody, through somebody, about this church, about what was going on, about who Jesus was. It was a combination of different people. The Bible talks about how some people plant, some people water, but we are all working together for the harvest of what God's doing in our lives. Amen? And it's such a privilege that we, right now, this church... We talk about our tithes and our offerings. It's such a privilege that we, as a body of believers here in Faribault, Minnesota, get to impact the nations through our giving, through our prayers, through our time. Raise your hand if you've been on a missions trip here. Amen? How many guys were here during Mission Faribault? That's a lot of years ago. Do you know... 
that you don't have to fly across the world to serve others. You don't. You don't have to fly across the world to serve others. The Great Commission starts at home with your family, with your friends, with your next door neighbor. Sometimes, especially, unfortunately, when we're familiar, you know, you get in close proximity with people, sometimes having the right heart of serving, you can kind of lose it, right? We would love to go on a mission trip across the country, but we don't really necessarily want to talk to our neighbor. Right? So where's the breakdown there? Is it in the, is it in the Great Commission, or is it maybe in our heart? Because who counts as all nations? All nations. You know, God so loved the world that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Who's whosoever? Whosoever. Whoever would respond. Amen? Sometimes when it comes to the heart of serving, we can get a little mixed up and a little backwards. And that's what I want to talk about today. But first I want to tell you a really short story. I was, when I was younger, my brother Gabriel and I, Gabriel was playing bass today. My brother Gabriel and I, we shared a room until we were like 17. I was 17. He was 16. And, um, and what we would do, because we were best friends, we would scheme. We'd work together. We'd plot. And there was this movie in the 90s that came out. And it wasn't Toy Story, but basically the whole premise was these toys that the government accidentally put military technology into, and they came alive. And it was actually rated PG-13, so we couldn't watch it. We just saw the commercials um, as, as youngins. Um, but it had some really cool toys. So we asked for the toys for Christmas. But we knew we had to strategize and be smart about it. So I really wanted, like, this G.I. Joe character. I forget his name. But, so I had the idea, since Gabriel's birthday was closest, that he should ask for it for his birthday. And really, my motivation was that so I could play with it. <clears throat> and this happened with many things. And the same lesson happened with many ways, and I should have learned my lesson. But, lo and behold, Gabriel received this toy... For his birthday. He received the toy for his birthday. And because brothers who are good friends, we're all fallen beings under the curse of sin, he withheld the toy from his loving older, older brother, <laughs> e even though we were in cahoots to get it. <clears throat> and so by the time Gabriel actually allowed me to play with this toy, other than the times I would beat him up and forcefully take it, um, I kind of lost interest. Um, chip, chip hazard. <laughs> That's what this, this is kind of dumb. But see, I was very selfish and self-serving. Why tell you a goofy story about a meaningless toy from our past? Because the point is, Sometimes when we lose track of the right heart of serving others, we become selfish, prideful, self-serving, and we try to manipulate things so we can really get our way. It sounds good for me to suggest that he should do this so he can have the benefit. That sounds really good. And honestly, if you wrote that down on paper and you had like Ben Stein read it in his monotone voice, it might even be convincing. However, the reality is it's just not the case. I was selfish, manipulative, and self-serving in the way I had my brother get the toy that I wanted to play with, right? This happens with serving. When we lose heart of what God's called us to do, the great commission can turn into the great obligation, right? We can write down our good intentions and say, this is what we're going to do, 
And really, at the end of the day, we're kind of looking for the reward. We're looking for the pat on the back. The Pharisees did things to be seen by men. But Jesus says, don't let your good works seen, be seen before men, but for the Father who is in heaven. And he will see and reward you. Amen? Serving others well, you know, we can get burned out. We can, people can stop returning the favor, right? When you serve others, people can stop returning the favor. And then suddenly it's not that fun, right? We can get selfish, we can get bitter, and then all of a sudden our passion for the Great Commission, like I said, turns into the Great Obligation. We don't want the wrong heart. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. You want to put that up there? Oh, sorry. My message this morning, excuse me, uh, is called the heart of serving. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Amen? Okay. Back to John chapter 13. Let's read our passage and let's get going. John chapter 13, verse 1, and I'm going to read actually the first 15 verses. It's a little long, but I really want you guys to see the context. Because this starts the discourse of Jesus' conversation with the disciples in the upper room. If you look at the Gospels, many of them have like a couple chapters devoted to Jesus' last week on earth. The book of John has eight or nine chapters devoted just to the last week of Jesus' life. Well, the book of John has the most chapters for the last week of Jesus' life. It's very detailed, and I want to go through 13, verse 1 through 15. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel <clears throat> with which he, has, he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him and said, What I do you, uh, excuse me, what I do you, excuse me, verse 7, <laughs> what I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Jesus said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, Not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet, and taken his garments, and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Amen. I don't know why I picked pretty much the most oversized water bottle I could find. Sorry. See, the good news here is that Jesus is our example. He gave us a perfect example on how to have the right heart for serving others. I want to look at three aspects of how serving... Uh, I want to look at three aspects of serving Jesus... I'm writing... I'm Sorry. My notes are a uh, little screwy. I want to look at three ways Jesus showed us how to serve others. Amen? From this passage, 
he demonstrated it perfectly, and even in verse 13, 15, he said he gave us that example specifically. The first way is that serving starts with love. Serving starts with love. Verse 1 and 2 says, Now before the feast of Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas, Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Let's stop there. First off, look at what it says. Knowing that his hour had come to depart. What does that mean? That's a really nice way of saying Jesus knew that he was going to die soon. The hour of him departing is the cross. It's a nice way of saying he was going to die soon. This is talking about the cross, and it says he knew, he knew his time had come. This is the backdrop for everything else that Jesus does the rest of this passage. The knowledge of what is coming in the, in the coming days. It's what he first mentions, and it's what's on his mind. It's the conscious and purposeful awareness of what's to come, and it was on his mind as he served the disciples in this way, of washing their feet. See, the cross is the greatest example of the love of God the world has ever seen. Amen? The cross is the greatest example of love the world has ever seen. John 15, 13, you want to put that up there, it says, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. John, 1 John 3.16 says, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And then John 3.16, you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The cross is the greatest example of God's love the world has ever seen. And that's exactly where Jesus started. That was what was in his mind. In Hebrews, it says that it was the joy set before Jesus that he endured the cross, despising its shame. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he was accomplishing. He laid his life down of his own initiative, and he has the authority to pick it back up. Amen? Serving starts with love. <clears throat> Serving starts with the cross. When we have a glimpse of the cross, we see God's rich love and mercy for us. We see his forgiveness. We see how he makes us new creations. We see how he washes us clean and gives us a new name, a new heart, new and right desires. He sets us free from our old ways and makes us brand new. Amen? 1 John 4.19 isn't up there, but it says we love, we are even able to love because he first loved us. Serving others starts with love, but love starts with the Lord. Amen? And the only way we can have that right relationship where God's love can fill us and flow through us is through the cross and what Jesus accomplished for us. In fact, do you know what you've even been forgiven from? It's a good question. You personally... You might know the story, you might know the fact of the matter, that through the cross we have been afforded us forgiveness of sins, but do you, do you know what you've been forgiven of? Have you taken your sin to the cross? Have you put your trust in Christ? Right? You know, coming to church is I'm glad you're here. It's a good place to be. It's the best place to be on a Sunday morning. Amen? To be in the house of the Lord, giving Him glory. And I love that song we sang, the first song, Oh, precious is the flow that washed me white as snow. 
What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. When we see the cross for what it is, the rich love of Christ where he poured out his blood for us, that though our sins are scarlet, his crimson blood makes us white as snow. When we see that type of love, we see what we've been forgiven of. In Luke chapter 7, there was a sinful woman that came and, and, uh, and she was crying and pouring perfume and wiping her hair and washing Jesus' feet with her tears. And it was almost a shameful display. But Jesus didn't stop her because, actually, you put, put that up there, Luke seven forty seven. It says, for this reason I say to you, when the people judged her and they were uncomfortable with what she was doing, Jesus said... I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who for, is forgiven little, loves little. Do you know what you've been forgiven of? And I think the more we see the cross for what it is, and the more we see our sin for what it is, and how it separates us from a holy and perfect and loving God, we see and we become a little bit more like this woman. Because the lie is there are really big sins and there are really little sins and as long as we just keep in the little sin category, we'll be good with God and, and it's not that big of a deal. And that's just a lie. It's just a lie. The Bible says that all have fallen short of God's glorious standard. We've all gone astray. It says that there's no one righteous, no, not one. And are you going to trust in our good, your goodness and your self-righteousness, or are you going to trust in the blood of Christ that washes you white as snow? Because it's the love of God that was poured out that makes us brand new. And when it comes to serving others, that has to start with the cross, us knowing that we are loved so we can therefore love others. Amen? See, but you know... Loving others isn't always easy, right? In fact, Jesus even says that in the Sermon on the Mount. Anybody can love their friends. It's easy. But he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That is difficult. And you know what? That was at pretty much the beginning of Jesus' ministry. That was towards the beginning. How many of you guys know that this is now towards the end and Judas is still hanging out with them? But Jesus loved the disciples. It says that he loved the disciples to the end. If you read the end of verse 1, go back to verse 1 and 2 of John 13. It says, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. A lot of your Bibles will have a little note on to the end. And what that means is eternally or to the uttermost. What that actually is saying is Jesus loved his disciples perfectly and completely. And did you notice that he's in, Judas is included? Later it says that he wasn't clean, he wasn't, he wasn't really one of them. But it, Jesus loved Judas. Jesus washed Judas' feet, right? There's a... <laughs> Jesus had the right heart loving Judas. There's a Robin Williams little blip that I saw and I don't know what, what it's actually from but Robin Williams is talking about how Jesus at the Last Supper was going around the table and he's saying one of you will betray me and Thomas says this is Robin Williams so it's much funnier but Thomas says is it me Jesus and Jesus says no it's not you Thomas and Peter says is it me Jesus and, and Jesus says no it's not you Peter and John says, is it me, Jesus? And, and Jesus says, no, it's not you, Jesus. Not, not you, John. And Judas says, is it me, Jesus? And Jesus says, is it me, Jesus? <laughs> That's funny, but 
couldn't be further from the truth. Um, see, the reality is, I mean, if you really think about it, Jesus loved these men. He made Judas, who was a rotten thief, in charge of the treasury. Do you realize that? A lot of us would have some really big issues with that style of church government. But Jesus knew what he was doing. He loved his disciples perfectly and completely. These were men who would betray him. These were men who would deny him. These are men who would desert him in like 24 hours. 24 hours. These are men who struggled to get the point of most of his teachings, where he had to come back and explain them, explain it again. These are men who had many flaws, many failures, who got rebuked often, and even got called Satan, because they had their own earthly thinking in mind. These, and you know what? God used these men, Jesus used these men to change the world. Amen? God calls us to love others even when it will cost us. God calls us to serve others in love even when they will betray us. God will call you to serve some people that are straight up just going to stab you in the back. And that's tough. But Jesus modeled that. And he actually said, this is the example I give to you. Wash one another's feet. Right? And not only, you know, it's not even just bad attitudes and bad personalities. But if you read verse 2, it says, During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. God's going to ask you to minister and love people who are straight up influenced by Satan. Right? Is that not what that's saying? And you know what? If Jesus had one, we're probably going to have a couple more. But he lays down his life for whosoever. Amen? Romans 5.8 But God demonstrates his own, his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Aren't you glad that's the gospel? Aren't you glad that while we were enemies with God, he showed us mercy? I have said such foolish things I'd turn red as a cherry if I repeated them. And that's, those are just words that have come out of my mouth. If we had a projector screen hooked up to our hearts, you would go hide in a cave. <laughs> I mean, think of what Christ has forgiven us of towards other people, towards him. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us because he loved us. Amen? Serving others has to start with the cross. It has to start with love for others. If you don't want the great commission to turn into the great obligation, you need to cry out to the Lord to give you a heart of love and compassion for those who are lost. Amen? And a heart of compassion for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Second thing, how, first off, how in the world do we do that? How do I love a Judas? Right? How do I do that? The th second thing is serving flows from identity. Serving flows from identity. Verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things, say all things, into his hands, and that he had come forth from God, say from God, and we was going back to God. Thank you. I was wondering. See, Jesus knew serving starts with love. 
but it comes and flows from our identity. Jesus knew who he was and why he had come and where he was going. He knew who he was, why he had come, and where he was going. He had purpose and identity. Matthew 3, 17, when Jesus got baptized, he came up out of the waters, and behold, a voice out of the heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Again, on the Mount of Transfiguration, it's not up there, but Jesus is talking with Moses and Elijah about his soon departure, about the cross and about the events to come. And a voice from heaven says to the disciples, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Right? Jesus knew who he was, and the Father affirmed it. He knew that he was the Son. He knew that he was beloved. Do you know that you are a beloved child of God when you put your trust in Christ? Do you know that? Do you know that John 1.12 says that all who have believed in Christ have been given the right, the right, we love rights, the right to become children of God. Whereas before we were enemies, because of his great love, we now have the right to be his children and to boldly approach the throne of grace. Amen? See, Jesus knew who he was, that all things, go back to the verse 3, all things into his hands. All things into his hands. This is total authority. Complete authority. Authority. Amen? All things. What does that include? All things. The fact of the matter is that it's a confidence that he had everything he needed. Everything he needed. There's no greater name than the name of Jesus. He has all authority in heaven and, and on earth. When Jesus gave the great commission, he started with the authorization to do so. What does it say in Matthew 28, 18? It says, all authority has been given to me. What right do we have to go into all nations and make disciples of Jesus? Right here. All authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. All things were given to Jesus. He knew who he was, and he knew why he had come, and he knew where he was going. It said he had come from the Father. Go back to verse 3. He had come from the Father. He had purpose in what he was doing. He was on a mission. He had come from the Father. Jesus had come to accomplish what he came to do. Amen? And when he gave his last breath on the cross, right before that he said, it is finished. He came and accomplished what he set out to do. The Bible says that the word of the Lord does not return void. It accomplishes everything that it sets out to do. We need to realize that if we are going to have the heart of serving, if we're going to mo if follow after Christ's example and footsteps, we serve a God who follows through. Amen? And some of us need to really receive that. I do. I'm a professional starter. I I'm just being transparent. I know that my personal character flaw and great need is that I love starting things and I'm awful at seeing them through I mean, how much does that just stir confidence that your pastor is saying that to you <laughs> but seriously you know Ephesians 4 talks about how God gives grace as as 
it is his will to do so. He gives grace to people in the body, and my grace is ideas and starting things. And then, by God's grace, I need people around me, and I need a support and a team, and we'll see it through. Amen? And if you don't know your character flaws, how are you going to excel in what God's given you a gifting about? Right? That, that's, that's a good word. <laughs> I'm glad I can share in my weaknesses. Um, but here's the deal. God follows through. Jesus came from the Father, and he did what he set out to do. And then he was going back to the Father. Jesus knew where home was, right? Jesus knew where home was. I mean, technically, all things came into being because of him and through him and for him and by him. But, so, the earth is the Lord's. But he was going back to the Father. He was going back to the Father. His focus was not all about this life. What he could get. And while, while he was here. Right? And our focus shouldn't be there either. We need to know where home is. Amen? We need to know where we're going. How many of you guys would like to follow someone who has no idea where they're going? And I'm not even talking about getting lost. That's at least not even being able to find a des the destination. But would you like to follow someone with no destination? And I'll just say, you know, Father's Day is next weekend. We're all growing in this, but dads, have a destination you're taking your family. Where are you walking that your family can follow? In your, in your, in your relationship with Christ, could, would you enjoy your children to follow in your footsteps? Right? In your work ethic, would you appreciate your children to follow in your footsteps? In how you treat your wife, would you enjoy your sons following in your footsteps? Where are you going? Jesus knew where he was going. He actually said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Everything I do is because my Father asked me to do it. If we follow Jesus, we are pursuing the Father. We are pursuing Jesus. Amen? The Holy Spirit actually comes and convicts us of sin, of, of righteousness, and of the judgment to come. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus, and Jesus glorifies the Father. When you have the Holy Spirit working in your life, you're going to be more like the Father. Amen? And dads, your children, if follow, you know what is the worst when I see my character flaws show up in my kids? It is, it, one, it drives me crazy because if we're, we're honest, our character flaws drive ourselves crazy. And two, I did that. <laughs> I put that there. And it's the worst. So let's pursue the Lord. Let's pursue discipline. Let's be excellent in all things. Colossians chapter 3, let's set our sights to the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Do you want your kids to be more heavenly minded or more earthly minded? And you know what? There are things that are just really fun to do. And it's not always praying and fasting. Okay? But what I'm saying is if we have our priorities straight, that's going to take care of a lot. Amen? Jesus knew where, who he was, where he had come from, and where he was going. This was the backdrop. I mean, look at this. Jesus, knowing all these things, the very next verse, 
he washes his disciples' feet. Do you have a right identity of who you are in Christ? Jesus was secure in who he was, so there was no hesitation to humble himself and wash his disciples' feet. He knew who he was. It doesn't matter that it was a lowly, completely undesirable thing. He knew who he was. All authority was his. And I'm, my question to us this morning is, do you know who you are? Because we have personalities, we have quirks, we have giftings, we have talents and character flaws like we were talking about. But do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know what the Bible says about you? And guys, I cannot stress it enough, you need to read the Word of God. We have a culture, guys, if, if I could just say, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you want to, go ahead. There's a generation growing up right now. It used to be everybody went to church. Everybody at least knew who Jesus was in America, I'm talking about. Even in small town America. There are, there's a generation that knows more about TikTok and Pornhub than the Word of God. Right? And sometimes we don't want to admit that. We would really like to conveniently brush that to the side. And I'm not... I don't want to point fingers, but we need to know the Word of God. We have people believing lies. We have people harming themselves for all kinds of reasons. Sexually, emotionally. We have a generation, we have generations of people that are lost, purposeless, and aimless. We've lost the value of life. I mean, abortion is being, you know, praise God we have some things, you know, some barriers coming down. But it's not just safe, legal, and rare anymore. It's celebrated and encouraged. I mean, that's just one issue. And, you know, it, it's unfortunate when we reduce Christianity to issues the issue is we need to follow the Lord. The issue is we need to honor God. I love, I was having a conversation um, with my friend, Kelly. We were talking about a verse that is just the best. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Ecclesiastes can get pretty interesting like what's the point eat drink and be merry for life is meaningless i mean it's in the bible um but the end of ecclesiastes it says the conclusion when all has been heard is this fear god and keep his commandments because this applies to every person we are all going to have to face the lord someday and do you want to face the Lord with your righteousness? Do you want to plead your case? Or do you want Christ's righteousness? Pleading a better word over your life. And there is generations of people who are completely lost. They don't even know that there's hope. They don't even know. And if we don't know what the Word of God says... If we have no idea what the Word of God says, how are we going to give them the hope that is right here? It's right here.
The Bible shows us a contrast, Hosea 4.6 and Psalm 139, 14. When we know our identity in Christ, Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that's not the ABCs in calculus, okay? This is the knowledge of God, of who He is, of what He requires from us of who he wants to be in our lives and who we should be according to who he is. Compare that to Psalm 139, 14. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. Do you know the works of the Lord very well? The book of Judges if you read the book, and this, you know, the book of Judges, it's many chapters of the exact same thing happening over and over and over. It's a book of cyclical, spiraled failure. Where the people would forget God, and they would go, and it says that everybody did what was right in their own eyes. It could not be closer to what is actually happening in our day. And they would forget God, they would forsake God, and they would do what was right in their own eyes. And then, magically, like some crazy coincidence would happen, they would reap what they sowed. And I'm being facetious, but we disconnect that all the time. Like the character flaws, like the little quirks that I see in my kids. Sometimes they're cute, sometimes I'm like, God, help me. I don't want me showing up in my sons. It's, God would raise up a judge. He would save the day because he was a guy who honored the Lord. Or a gal. Can't forget about Deborah. And then things would be good. Forty years, usually. And then the whole cycle would start over. And in the first couple chapters of Judges, it said the generation that knew the Lord and all of his works died. And another generation came up that did not know the works of the Lord and did not know the Lord. Do we know the word of God? And I'm, guys, any way you can do it, it's like you wouldn't skip food, right? You wouldn't not go to work and say, I'll figure it out. Right? Why would we skip the bread of life that's good for the salvation of our soul? Right? There are so many ways. People died. And you know what? This is a little off, off topic, but guys, people gave their lives so we could know and read the Word. And we're not... Have, we're not in a relationship with a book. We're in a relationship with the living God. But how will they know? Romans chapter 10. How will they know unless somebody tells them? Right? It is such a privilege to have the word of God. There are countries where people are killed because they have a Bible. And we got like 10. Each. Don't look at me. I use them, okay? <laughs> I like the Bible. Um, guys, when you know who you are, you are free to serve others. You have the answers. Do you know how good it feels? Okay, the, the furthest thing I could be from something is a mechanic. I, I've, I can change my oil, I've replaced alternators, I can do the things, I can change a tire, I'm a disciplined 740 man, amen? <laughs> but I just don't like working on cars. It's the worst to me. But it's awesome when you open the hood and the problem's right there. And you just go... I'm awesome. 
Because my tiny bit of knowledge in that regard, when you have the solution to a problem, it feels awesome, right? And when we have the word of God and our identity, our identity in Christ figured out, and we see people hurting, we see people in need, and we're able to come to them with the answer. It's just the best. Because it's the hands and feet of Jesus reaching out into people's lives and meeting them where they truly need it. Amen? Third thing. Serving is done in humility. Verse 4 and 5. Listen. Jesus knew these things. He knew that the cross was near. He loved his disciples. He knew who he was, where he was from, and where he was going. And now he's washing the disciples' feet. And it says, Jesus got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Jesus got up in the middle of supper as the leader of that group. The last guy that should have got up. He got up as the leader of the group and did the work of a slave. He did the work of a servant. In the Jewish culture, not even disciples of other rabbis would wash their rabbi's feet. In fact, it was such an undesirable thing to do that the servants were mostly Gentiles because you could not force a Jewish servant to wash people's feet. They did, but you could not force them if they didn't want to. And here's Jesus. You know, they had sandals. They'd be walking all day. And you don't even need to over-exaggerate it like they stepped in a big pile of camel, whatever. It's like, you don't even need to over-exaggerate it. They just had dirty feet. Yuck. And Jesus got up from the middle of his dinner. He left his comfort. He was lounging at the table. He was being served food. He was in the place of comfort. Being served. And he gets up from there. But that's not all he does. He, he laid aside his garments. Now he's not in his underwear. He still had like a tunic on. But the men would have outer, long outer garments. And he took them off to do the work of a servant. He laid aside his garments. Jesus not only set aside his garments, but he laid aside his glory in heaven to come lay his life down on the cross for us. You think about the humility of our God. He left glory. He's the king of majesty. Everything in existence came into being for his good purpose and will. And here he is, Emmanuel, God with us, taking off his coat to wash his disciples' dirty feet. He laid aside his glory. Philippians 2, verse 7 through 9, it says, But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of a man, he, as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason... Amen? God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. And it goes on to say, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord and every knee will bow because he is the king of all kings. Amen? This is the God we serve. And this is the example he set for us to serve others. Not only did Jesus take this posture, but literally, like I said, his outer garments would have hindered his movement. I don't, okay, another transparency thing. I don't usually wear a blazer. Um, and 
maybe I'm channeling my inner Tommy boy or something, but um, I can't even tie my shoes in this thing. Maybe that's my own problem. But this hinders my movement. Right? <laughs> Honey, don't laugh. Here. Set an example, please. <laughs> this hinders my movement. Right? You can agree with me. It hinders my movement. But here's the deal. What's the stereotype in America? The pastor. The man of God. High and lofty. Church people. Church people have no problems. Right? Someone's honest. Pastors know everything. Right? And I could never be transparent because then I'd just get judged. But you know what? What is hindering your movement? What is a barrier between serving people? Because if, if we, if, 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 if I acted self-righteous, if I acted like, just like a self-righteous know-it-all that, you know, I'm, I'm the perfect pastor and I'm here, you know, it's like, come on, man, give me a break. We're falling. And you know what? I'm going to do my best to bring the word of God that's tr that trains, corrects, teaches, admonishes, builds us up in our faith. But if I have that attitude towards others, that I'm the big shot, it's like, what a goofy thing. That's hindering my movement of serving others. And you got to lay that aside. <laughs> See, Tommy boy. You have to lay it aside. Because there are people in our lives that really need help. It's like there are people whose lives are falling apart, right? And they need the answers that are found in Jesus. And if my movement is hindered to help, how are these people going to hear what Christ has accomplished for them? How are these people going to know the love God has for them in their brokenness. The faithfulness that God has for them in their time of need. And the forgiveness that God has for them through their sin. Now, right here, like, I couldn't, I can't even reach the top book on a bookcase. Now, don't freak out, everybody. I'm going to keep my clothes on here. But it's like, <laughs> but I, it's like Jesus, when he, Jesus humbled himself, he humbled himself to the point where a, a, a slave would have done that work. It's like, how can I? Jesus took off his outer garment. He humbled himself. It's like, I got full movement here. I have full movement. And you know what? I kind of look ridiculous. But I have full movement. Because I'm going to lay aside the things that hinder me from serving others. Jesus laid aside his garments and taking a towel... He wrapped himself, and then he washed the disciples' feet. If we want to serve others, we need to remove what gets in the way. Ah, that person's got it all together. Are you sure about that? Are you sure? Why don't you ask them if they need any help? Uh, 
uh, if, I, if I started becoming friends with that guy, I'd be like one of those guys. Who cares? Right? If I started, you know, if I started sharing the gospel with this guy at work, people would think, uh, you know, I, who cares? You know what is the worst thing that we can do as believers? Revoke people's chance at redemption. Where we decide ahead of time that they don't want to hear what God has so costly paid for. Right? How foolish of us. How just goofy. What? Ah, they, don't, they probably don't want a million dollars. They look like they have a nice job. It's like, that's ridiculous. Remove the things that hinder you and get in the way. Amen? The Great Commission doesn't have to be the great obligation. It starts with God's love for people. Because people matter to God. Amen? And you know what? There are sins that we need to forsake and leave behind. Okay? That's, it's not all lovey-dovey. That's not what I'm saying. But God's love compels us to lay down our lives for others. We need to know who we are in Him. And we need to remove the things that keep us from walking in humility. Because being humble is the example that Jesus set forth for us. Amen? Let's stand and pray. Father, we just thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for the cross. God, how you paid the highest price. Lord, you paid the price that we deserved. Lord, you gave us your love and beauty for our ashes and our sin. Lord, I thank you that you give us a new name. Lord, I thank you that your word says that if anybody is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Lord, I pray that you would help us to honor you in everything we do. Lord, I pray that you would fill our heart with your love, not only for us, that we would know your thoughts towards us, how they are so wonderful we cannot even attain it, like Psalm 139 says, but Lord, that we would have your love for the lost and those around us, God. Father, I pray that you would help us to know our identity in Christ, and Lord, I just pray for those who have a hard time reading your word. God, I pray that you would Fill them with a grace to dive into Scripture like they've never been able to before. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would empower them to open the Word of God, to read the words on the page, and to hear from the God who is alive and active in our lives. Father, we give you glory for how you're so faithfully taking us through growing in Christ. And Lord, I ask that you would help us to walk in humility. God, that we would never disqualify somebody or some act of service because of our pride or self-serving nature. Help us to humble ourselves. God, that we would honor you in everything we say and do. Lord, we thank you that you didn't come to be served, but you came to serve and lay your life down for us. God, we give you all the honor and glory, and we ask that you would bless this week. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone said, amen.